I'm on. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Paul Brian Jones. I've uh, been here since 1986. I've been in horticulture since 1972. So I have a little bit of background in horticulture, botany, reclamation, environmental sciences, arboriculture, <laughs> and now, uh, in last May, I got my master's in environmental management. So, I'm still learning. And as we go forward, uh, I think that's why we're all here. We're all learning as we go. And so this is going to be our kind of a... Jan put this together for me. I went over it for about an hour today after I got out of the field. So I have some additions to what's here. So we're going to go through each slide pretty slowly. Okay. She gave you a handout, so I'll let you take note because I'm going to have additions to what's up here. So the first thing, I gave a talk at Valverde Commons about two, three weeks ago, and it's about um, what they grow down there. They're in a whole different location, and I'll get to uh, different locations in Taos. Can everybody hear me still? Okay. All the way back there? Okay. So um, one thing I tell people is to walk your neighborhoods. When you build a home and you're in a neighborhood or a homeowners association, you should walk the area to find out what really grows there. See what trees and shrubs exist there. And that's probably your best bet to get, get you started. Uh, and to add to that, um, plants at different people's homes are actually in little microclimates. And everybody knows that. Their backyard may have an adobe wall around it. Their front yard is on the northeast side in the shade a lot. So the plants that are at individual homes might not fit at your home, but because of the microclimate. So you can develop your own microclimates because you can actually soften that zone effect around your home because of our heat and our coldness. So that's what I like to tell people about microclimate. Then I came up with a word called mesoclimate. And everybody goes, what's a mesoclimate? A mesoclimate is just the different areas we have in town because what grows on Weimar Hill really doesn't grow in lower Las Colonias. It's a total different environment. So when you go to buy a plant, you have to tell people where you're located at, and hopefully the nurseries will kind of be educated so they can suggest plants for your area. Okay, and that's mesoclimates. I talk about that in class a lot. Um, Arroyo Seco is different than town, top is different than Arroyo Hondo, and on and on and on. So, Make sure you let the nursery know where you live, because they don't know, and they want to help you out as much as they can. Next slide, please. Ground covers. You'll hear this a lot from Gordon Tooley and myself, no bare ground, because bare ground is not beneficial, it's not very healthy, it blows away, and uh, it gets harder and harder as the sun beats down on it, hotter and hotter, and I'll talk about hot soils later on. And um, so you should plant grasses or grass-like grass plants, which are beneficial. There are plants that fix the nitrogen in the soil. They actually decompose and really add benefits to your soil. And there's a mix that I didn't mention at my last talk. It's Gordon Tooley's Orchard Mix. Does anybody ever hear that? Yeah. It's a mix that you plant uh, either before you start planting your orchard or a tree area because it has different um, nitrogen fixtures like um, uh, red clover, white clover, uh, I think there's some uh, sand foin in it, oats and rye to get it up tall, their annuals to cover up the other seedlings coming up. So he's designed a really good mix that really works here in Taos with our heat and to get the germination we need and uh, you can buy it at the plants of the southwest. It is now being offered there. They call it? Gordon's Gordon Tooley's Orchard, orchard Mix. mix. So. Could you say that again? Gordon Tooley's Orchard Mix. And that works in all places? Yeah, and um, we're trying it in different hot spots well, because the, there's some people that have a lot of cheatgrass and bindweed and thistles, and we're trying to clear out areas and try to get this established. And I think Gordon says the best time to plant it is in the fall because in the spring is when your oats and your rice come up and then your other plants get established. So, of course, water is really 
important when you put down grass seeds or if you keep it dormant make sure it starts being watered in the springtime. I always sprinkle mulch over everything I do. I'm a mulch man. So if you see, see a pile of mulch and it disappears, I probably took it. Because I love mulch. And I don't put it in my cereal. <laughs> I put it on the ground. Next. <laughs> okay, these are some of the pictures that um, Jan came up with with her nice development of this PowerPoint. So on my PowerPoint, on the bottom, I said designed by Jan Martin. Oh. <laughs> so it's really important to give recognition for the... Because it, it's easy, but it's not. So it's, it takes some time. So this is Mountain ma 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 Mahogany. Um, beautiful. I love the seed pods on this. It's just a wonderful native plant. Uh, if you go to the Eco Park, uh, some of these plants hit there and at UNM are the only plants that has survived over all the lack of watering and stuff. It's over on um, Piedmont Road over by you, uh, Teresa. It grows just wild over okay. there. So it's, uh, what's that called? Canyon? Canyon? Canyon. Canyon, Canyon, yeah. Canyon. Canyon Heights. Yeah. So it's really everywhere and it's really a really tough plant. Next slide, please. My favorite, the privet. Um, we're still in New Mexicana, and you added? Well, apparently the newer nomenclature is pubescent, is Forestaria pubescens. Okay. Is that? It, one of them, the, the, the two different names were given by two different botanists. Okay. And so there's schools of thought that do both. But okay. You may, you'll see it in the garden centers, I think, and some of them is pubescent. Again, at, at the Eco Park, where the irrigation didn't run for five to ten years, this plant is still alive. And it's really, really a tough plant. And what's nice about it is it can be pruned to a single. You yep. can make it a tree. Yep. It can have multiple multiple branches or a single one. And the, how you do that, if you buy a plant that's multi-trunked, let it get established for the first three years, and then let it grow, and then slowly reduce it. Just don't whack it all up and leave a single stalk. I tell people to reduce it a third, a third, and a third. So do it slowly. Uh, is there anything you can do with the... Uh, with the berries? The berries? It's more for the birds, but is it? That's all I know. Yeah, it it's a bird berry, so it attracts the birds. Same with your hawthorns. So, okay, next slide. Golden currant and red currant. So these are both grown here, and again, another tough plant. If uh, you want to do low watering, almost zero scaping, this is a plant that once it's established is really tough, especially with the climate change coming about. We're going to get hotter and drier and colder and wetter, so it's going to go up and down. So some of these plants know how to uh, manage in some of these f flexible climate and weather changes. And what I liked about the red currant is how different the flowers are from the golden currant. Mm -hmm. The beautiful yellow tubular, which are some of the first things to bloom. They're blooming in April, right? Mm -hmm. And the bees just go nuts. Mm -hmm. Um, but then that red currant has like little hanging down clusters of a very different looking and, and flower. Got, if you hit it, it's got a sweet scent to it. And you can really? make jam out of this. Out of the, the, all the currants. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Choke cherries, which are just about everywhere. And I just was down in south, southern, uh, south of Española and this local for 40 years, we were taking care of his trees, so he wanted to go talk to the neighbor. He found choke cherries going along the side of the road that he never saw, knew was there. And he's been there 40 years. So that's in the hot parts of Española. So it's really a, a good plant. It's actually a tree. Uh, we have choke cherry trees over at Eco Park that we planted. It's a variety that's a tree species. And uh, it's really beautiful right now. It has red and green leaves on it right now. So it's a tree, a shrub, um, choke cherry jam, uh, some people make choke cherry wine. Yes, sir. They're real vigorous under El Salto, below the acequias. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere, yeah. Same with the plums, the wild plums. Yeah. I think that that's the slide over there. We have a lot of plums, and I found out we have wild cherries. Right. Uh, that was over by the Rim Road. I found some wild cherries over there. So. And then there's wild apricots, too. Wild apricots. Just somebody here in Taos is really 
Yeah, Nicholas what? Schmidt is actually collecting seeds from our native uh, uh, apricots that come out on their own. And he also collects the varieties that seem to have fruit every year. So the ideal apricot tree is the way he explained it to me, and it's, I hope I get it right, is the ones that bloom over a four to six week period. So that frost period, they keep on blooming and blooming and they do get fruit each year. So and that's some of the species he's collecting and growing and selling in the future. Have you ever seen the fruit from these wild ones? Yeah, they're really small. That, but they're the typical orange. Yeah. They mm -hmm. look like an apricot. But they look like small. an apricot. Have you tasted real? them? Tasted them? No. Okay. Oh. Has anybody? Wild apricot? I would like to think that they're better. Of, I do a lot of wrangling where if I see some fruit along the road that's not claimed. That's called plundering. <laughs> so could some of them could be wild? I think they're just old volunteer trees or something. It's just like the peach tree that comes up in your compost pile. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the bird delivers. Okay, next slide, please. Mugo pine. <laughs> the story I have about this is they sell them as dwarf. And I've seen some mugos that are seven, eight, and nine feet tall. <laughs> And a lot of people get all upset because they were supposed to be dwarf mugos. But nobody told the mugo that. So. <laughs> they seem to, if they really like an area, they really take off. So. Now, if I've got my carter right, this is not a Taos County native. It's no, it's not. It's, brought in. it's a naturalized species. So that, when, I, when I see things that do well here, not invasive, that really is a tough plan on the low maintenance side for irrigation especially, I, I, I like to call it natural. We like immigrants. Yes. <laughs> I like immigrants. <laughs> what do the cones look like on that? Oh, uh, they're all over. And uh, do you have a picture of that? There it is. No, I didn't find any. Well, I didn't. They're really tight that. cones. They're not real expandable. They're just really tight. And they're all over the tree. So they're not just at the upper levels like spruces. All the cones are up top. So they're all over them. And these are very common in garden centers. They have all different cultivars that have different mounding habits. Some get pyramidal, some uh -huh. get, they get different shapes and different heights. Mm -hmm. Okay, sumac, uh, which is, uh, my favorite is a three-leaf sumac. So uh, I love the berry on it. It's really a tough plant. Again, zero escape, really native to our area. Red twig dogwood. Grows in Pot Creek everywhere <laughs> along the, 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 the Rio down there. It's pretty amazing. Uh, Jan told me a story that. Uh, who, who, well, who? it's also called a re, an osier. Osier. And osier is a common term. In fact, I think it's a genus name for some willows. willows. Yeah. And of course, we have the red willows. Yeah. And then these red twig dogwoods, that's the way the new twigs come up, is red. So when they're bare, you see that. Yeah. So apparently the early namers and that's how called it a... Uh, us to uh, label, we have one over in the most Rogers courtyard, uh -huh. Uh -huh. put in as a red osier. osier? Red osier, yeah. Okay. So it was just a common name yeah. for something they thought was a willow, but mm -hmm. it turned out was a, a cornice. Uh, yeah, that's really yeah. Cool. Okay, next one. Oh, our favorite, rubber rabbit bud. <laughs> rabbit brush. I, we used to call it rubber rabbit brush when we were out in the field. So yeah. we used to sit, see if we could say that three times real fast. And there are several species of that. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and then the Apache plume is one of my favorite. You, I see them growing out of rocks. Really a unique, strong shrub type. And what's good about nice about them is they will have a flush of the white blooms and then go to these pink tipped seeds, uh -huh. and then they'll keep blooming. Yeah. All summer. Mm -hmm. So and they're so wonderful backlit. If you can put them, you know, with the That's setting sun behind them, they're just spectacular. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Elderberries, um, trees and shrubs. Uh, there's some big ones over in Tapa that are 30 feet tall. Some of these elderberries that uh, I found out that were 50, 60 years old, planted there. Really beautiful trees. Um, Nanking, Nanking cherries. Um, they're more of a shrub in some places, but they're pretty good, pretty woody. Um, I have a lot, of, a lot of clients that have them on their orchard areas, bordering their orchard areas. Um, there are other species of cherries. They're called dwarf cherry trees that they sell at Ace, and 
some of them get to 40 below. So some of them are called Romeos, some of them are called Juliet, and they're really good uh, cold hardy type shrub cherries. So. Next. Tree, poplar in the willow family. Genus populus, uh, everybody knows the white poplar and that's one that people call silver leaf, it's in the bottom right corner. That's the underside of the leaf. Yes, yeah, the underside, but a lot of people, you'll see the green side and the, and the shaking in the wind and people said, oh, that's a silver poplar. But it's actually a white poplar. Lombardi, fast growing, but also fast dying. It can grow seven to nine feet a year and be gone in 20, 25 years. It's very columnar. Um, lance leaf is the one on the center there, and um, we have a lot of those around, really a tough tree. Cottonwoods, we have Rio Grande cottonwoods here. We have Fermentia here. Aspens. <laughs> I think we have, that. that is actually the, yeah, the, the lance leaf cottonwood. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was shown one time in Baca Park, mm -hmm. all three species. Right. They're all there. The Fremont, the Lansleaf, yep. and the, yep. oh, the Rio Grande. Rio Grande. They all seem to like it here. And you can buy them here and they do very, very well. And actually, since we're talking about cottonwoods, there's a great book I just happened to bring. It's called Cottonwood and the River of Time. And this is about our native cottonwoods in North America, and it goes back 10,000 years. And that's what everybody used to follow. Follow the cottonwoods, you'll find water, and you start your homesteads there. So it's a great book to read. It's really a, a really simple, quick read book. I'm going to stop with aspens because <laughs> um, it is a native, but it's really challenging here. 60% of my uh, tree problems are aspens because they really don't like it hot down here. And a lot of people don't understand they're a communal tree. They love to put out babies. A lot of people say, oh, we have one, but we have all these invasive saplings, but the babies feed the mother plant. And they, the people don't understand, you're cutting off the lifeline of an aspen tree if you cut down their babies. It's part of the source, they're communal trees, they feed each other. So, don't plant them on the southwest, west side of your home. Plant them on the north, northeast side, the east side of your home where it's cooler. Um, there's a disease called sudden aspen decline. They, dev they found it out in 2002. They had a conference in the uh, University of Utah. They were losing all their aspens there. They found out it was three different insects and three different funguses killing the tree. And if you go over Chama Pass, we had that problem in 08, 09, 010, where it started wiping out the aspens. And then people getting firewood bought it into town. So that orange oozing you see coming, canker disease is one of the diseases, black spots on the leaves, um, bark turning orange, there's so many uh, holes in your trees from a poplar borer, so there's so many different problems and they all combine at once and it actually kills single stem aspen trees that are over 20 years old first because they've been brought down here, they're single, they, all their babies have been removed and they're really suffering from their fruit source. So, any questions about aspen? Aspen is a beautiful tree, but buy them in clumps. If you buy an aspen, buy a clump of three or four. They sell them that way now. So don't buy a single aspen on the side of the road, please. Actually, don't buy any tree on the side of the road. <laughs> because I still see people selling evergreens that they pulled from the forest last week. You don't pull evergreens out of the forest and plant them now, I would say 70% chance they're going to die. Because they should be dormant when they're transplanted. I also added from this slide, um, I have a question. Yes. Aspen, this past year, winter, elk are coming in my yard and stripping the bark. Is there anything I can do besides fences? Yeah, you can wrap the bark. Uh, there's called tree wrap. You can wrap it all the way up to the bottom, highest branch that you can get to, a tree wrap. You can get plastic tree wrap. Uh, the paper tree wrap is what I like the best. You can actually put a, also um, fencing around it. I have a lady that put fencing around every tree she had. 
because of the elk this year and the deer. The deer do the same thing. Um, another suggestion is maybe put CDs on the bottom branches that reflect the light because the light will actually, if it's shining and uh, during the morning sunrise, it'll scare off the elk a little bit. But I don't know. Do you leave then the wraps on? No, you take it off and it's So spring. just put it on for the winter? Just for the winter, because that's a food source for the, for the elk and the deer. And I found out deer is actually eating pinon pine trees now out on Honda Seco Road. And that's during a, a, a season when they can't, they, they don't have a food source. So they've come down, it's probably a migration path where they built homes off of Honda Seco Road. The deer's always traveled through there, but now they have some appetizers to nibble on the way. <laughs> and they're eating pinon pine trees. They're eating the bark? No, the ends of them. The end all the way around. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's like they come back and have dessert and come back and have an appetizer. So it's pretty amazing. And then those trees have to be fenced. So I don't know about elk. I, I would say just wrap them for the, for the winter time. They also eat the tops of my lilac. I've heard that too. They like lilacs too. So maybe... Uh, but they were here first. Yeah, yeah. The elk. I was going <laughs> to say the elk were. Before yeah. the lilacs, yeah. yes, definitely. It's another food source, yeah. What's your view of the use of agrifos as a fungicide for the aspens? There's different prescriptions by different, you know. Yeah, uh, agrifos is a great general. product. It's, it's a systemic, and uh, I've heard people say paint it on the bark, put it in the soil. I would say do both if you had the sad disease. I'm doing both spring and yeah, fall, and, and my aspens at 7,400 feet low, uh -huh. and uh, it's helped. Well, my neighbors have lost a lot. Okay. Uh, timing is another thing. I found out the best time is April, yeah. before they when the flush yep. of leaves start coming out, okay. it really sucks it through that plant, and it really wards off the funguses because it's a broad spectrum fungicide. Okay, okay. and. It says it's safe enough for fruit trees, but it still has a caution and warning caution label on it. So I don't use it on fruit trees. Does it affect the pollinators? Uh, the bees or the butterflies? Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't see a warning label on it because it's more, more of a fungicide than it is an insecticide. Yeah, you know, we're just I'm just hand spraying on the trunks. Okay. And then pouring some the at the base. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, and then watering it yeah. in. I have great luck with it. I've been using that for about three years. I also use a product called actinobate, and that's another actinomyces, another fungicide uh, that actually affects it pretty well. So I, I, I rotate my fungicides, that way it's like that uh, the tree doesn't get used to one, then you add it. The actinobate is totally OMRI approved, and, it's, and I, I do the same thing, I paint it and drench it, so it's another product. And then I added something that's up here is our globe willows because the globe willows are on the drought tolerant side of the willow family. I mean, I've seen willows in a parking lot in, in a storage unit that's been there for 40, 50 years, but we're tables high, but nobody cared for it, and it's a beautiful globe willow. The one behind Taos Diner, yep. too? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's got hit and everything else, but it's it's still there, but globe willows are, are the dry side of the willows. Mm -hmm. So if you want a willow, that's a good one to try if you have a dry site, because they, 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 they don't mind being dry a little bit. But it's still, you have to warm at least once a week, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. Russian hawthorns. One of my favorite trees, as long as you don't get stuck by them. <laughs> the thorns are really mean. I can pair them a little bit harder than a, a Russian olive because they're really inconspicuous. They kind of blend in with the tree and all of a sudden you got it stuck through your glove and the Russian uh, hawthorns really, really are thorny but beautiful. And the fruit, uh, Jen and I was talking, the birds like it, but she said nobody's visited. It so they eat yet. it at your house, but they haven't. Yeah, they eat them at my house, but not at my house. house. <laughs> So all I'll those it, I'm going to put an arrow to her house. Yes, please. <laughs> all those pictures are the Russian hawthorn, but I listed the other two because I've got them all. Uh huh. And uh, 
Is the Kansas Hawthorne on uh, on the Cockspur side of it? Do you know about the Cockspur no. Hawthorne? They kind of grow wild uh, in southwestern Colorado. Okay. And that's another species that we should add to this list. Oh, okay. Because it's really a hardy, dry Hawthorne. It's on the dry side of the Hawthorns. Okay, next slide. It's my job. <laughs> Uh, at my last talk, I talked about the new elms, and I'm really excited because we need a fast-growing shade tree here that doesn't take a lot of water, and it's not invasive. So I'll tell you a little story. About 30 years ago, Dr. George Ware from the Morton Arboretum decided since we had the American Dutch Elm Disease, we need to do something about replacing our beautiful American elms. So he crossed American elms with Asian elms, and he came up with 12 to 15 different species. They are all growing down at UNM in, in Albuquerque, all 15 of them. Some of them don't like it higher for us, so there's these species here that we have listed actually work here in Taos. We've tried them all out. The frontier elm, which is the reddish color, which is beautiful in the fall, we just started that out last year trying it here. So. It's made it through the winter, but last winter wasn't very tough. It wasn't that cold. So it's kind of that borderline of minus 10, minus 20. So uh, the alkylate elm, which is pictured over there, is actually as big as a 40 to 60 foot tree when it's mature. It grows five to seven feet a year. Very little water, and it doesn't have any seeds. It's sterile, so it's a very good tree. It grows really fast. The Emerald Sunshine Elm only gets about 30, but that's the fall color, that beautiful yellow color. Drought tolerant, grows about five feet a year, once it's established. And then the new Lace Bark Elm is uh, just coming out, and I haven't seen the new ones, but there are Lace Bark Elms here in town that uh, Petrie's been selling for a few years and they seem to be doing okay. No seed problems, okay? They seed in the fall. So with our temperatures, they're kind of confused. They seed in the fall and then we get snow and cold temperatures so they don't germinate, okay? This is a good replacement for the problem we're having with the Siberian elms. We have 30% of our tree canopy in Taos is uh, Siberian elms. Some cities in New Mexico, 60% Siberian elms. There is a state grant now kind of doing a survey. Uh, ben Wright did a talk here at the Native Plant Society, did a lot of this investigation. He's kind of the expert on the Siberian elms that are growing here. And they're from the Gobi Desert, I mean, from China. I mean, they're really a tough plant. And now they have a free range here in New Mexico, south, southern Colorado, um, going into Arizona by Tucson. So it's a really aggressive plant, very invasive. So, any questions about the animals? Um, we're going to try to get most of these in the nurseries here because they've just been tried out for the last three to five years and they're working. Um, the, the article in last week's paper, it sounds like we are rethinking the Siberian elm. Yeah, um, this is my take of it. We're, we've got climate change happening. Things are getting hotter. This last two weeks is kind of an indicator where it's not cooling off as well as night. I think if we manage the Siberian elms, it'll be a really tough tree if it gets to 100 and 110 at 7,000 feet. It'll be at least a shade tree that we can count on. But, um, you know, I have mixed feelings. It, you, if you treat it right, it can be a nice shade tree. It's just the seeds that come out of that tree. You can get a thousand seed out of one tree. But there's good news, those seeds are edible. If you take them off the tree green, they're really sweet. If you take them off when they're browning, they're kind of a toasty flavor. So if somebody wants to start a business collecting <laughs> Siberian elm seeds, <laughs> that would be a multi-million dollar business pretty fast. So, and, and they are edible, so maybe something to think about. You see everybody on the ground on their hands and knees kind of eating seeds of Siberian Maybe they could be fermented for beer. Maybe. There you go. Uh -huh. Next slide, please. Oh, um, yeah, the honey locusts. You didn't talk about the honey locusts. 
Not yet. <coughs> oh, but it's there. Oh, I didn't see it. Then. <laughs> it's lurking under the elms. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a true. It's not a true locust, but it's a beautiful tree here. And everybody had problems with locusts this year. And my story is, 30 years ago, the, the locusts never came out until June because of our cold, longer winters. This year, we had those cold snaps in April and May, like May 20th, 24 degrees, that the locust said, wait a minute, we gotta reset our clock. We're not gonna come out early anymore. And we've had a lot of them get borers. There's some uh, locust borers in town that can actually kill your locusts. So if you see uh, big holes in your trees that are like a woodpecker, make sure you examine them. Because if they're non-symmetrical, because woodpeckers kind of go circle around and they have a pattern, if there's no pattern to it, you may have some locust borers. The best thing to do is just water your trees extra. That's my, my, my take on most of your borers. Most of your trees that have native insects, like borers, have a defense mechanism. So if they have enough sap and energy, they can actually defeat the borers. Most, most of the locusts I saw that died were unhealthy locusts from borers, okay? It's the health of the plant, just like us. If we're stronger, we can manage a lot of sicknesses. Okay. Honey locust, beautiful yellow. But it's not a true locust. It's not a true locust. Oh, I didn't know. But it's a native? Uh, it's not a native, it's a naturalized. Is that natural. the one that really has mostly yellow? Yeah. Yellow leaves? Yellow leaves in the spring. and. It can turn green. It can. Yeah. But it seems to be very hardy here. It's very, very hardy here. So that's they actually, uh, where is it? What was the name of that place? Applebee's? The restaurant that went under? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all honey locusts. They're just wild. Nobody's been watering them. And look at them. They look like a wild stand of uh, locusts. <laughs> so they're pretty tough tree. They use them in the uh, uh, Midwest for uh, street trees, island trees because they don't need a big root area to grow. So they're really a tough tree. Uh, hawk tree. This is a new one that Jan mentioned that grows wild here. Mm -hmm. um, where did you locate it I heard at? it from uh, Steve Carey, the butterfly guy, that it's a host plant. It's, it's very popular with butterflies. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it can be kind of shrubby. I first saw it down on the um, uh, La Vista Verde Trail. Okay. And these sweet, tiny little flowers, but and then the, the three prong leaf, and then they make those called wafer. hop tree because I yeah. guess wafer. Well, they kind of look like the Siberian elm seeds, seeds don't yeah. they? They don't really look like. I've hops. heard them nickname uh, wafer, uh, wafers. So. Yeah. Uh, service berry grows everywhere, and uh, we have some tree varieties that you can buy that are really hardy here. Uh, not a very big tree, 15, 20 foot tree. Next. Evergreens. I added to the slide, so I'm going to talk about the Rocky Mountain and the One Sea, which are our PJ trees out there. Um, so I think some of them cross pollinate. Um, I don't have an answer for that. I'm just talk, telling you a story. What? Because they look close. Some of them are almost really closely look look like a Rocky Mountain or a One Sea, and you don't really know what it is. You just pull it off the berry. And if there's only one seed in the berry, it's a one seed. Mm -hmm. If you find more than one seed, it's a, a Rocky Mountain juniper. But, I have, but you can have variation. The, yeah. the two seed, the Rocky Mountain could have one, two, or three. Yeah. But it should have around two. More, yeah. yeah. So, you need, so if you're checking it, yeah, you need check to check more, more than, than one, one seed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, those are really hardy trees. Um, I did see one today that's, that somebody planted too deep, about eight to 10 inches too deep that was browning really quick in the last four days. So we'll get to talk about planting trees a little bit later, but you cannot plant trees too deep here in our clay soils. 30% of the gas exchange is at the root flare. So if your trees are buried too deep, they start to suffocate and they can actually decline and or be stressed and get other secondary insects. So you gotta really watch your planting the trees, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But I do wanna add something to these Evergreen. I have the pines, and we stood. Richard and I talked about pines, and he said there's twelve, according to Carter. According and to Carter, I read twelve Taos County 
native conifers. Conifers, okay. Pines, spruce, uh -huh. fir, and uh, uh, junipers. Okay. So, the ones I don't have listed up here is the limber pine, which is, you can find them at, at, on different plateaus. It's Planus flexulus. Pinon pines, of course, that's our native tree here. Everybody worries about the Ips beetle, and they have sap running out of their tree, just water the tree extra, because that's a native insect. And I usually don't worry about the pinions unless we're in a serious drought. So, watering your trees extra is always my answer to healthier trees. Ponderosa pines, and then one I mentioned that Richard didn't know is the Southwest white pine. And that's a new classification. It's in, it looks identical to a limber pine, but the pine cones on the end, and I don't know, the, the scales are hooks instead of being rounded. They're actually like uh, beak hooks on the pine cones, and that's why it was reclassified. So it's called Pinus strobiformis. So that's that. There's some out by the stakeout restaurant in some valleys out there. So it's a beautiful, big tree just like a ponderosa. Really big, stoutly tree. Next slide. Sensation box elder. This is a tree that fast growing, doesn't get very big, 20 to 30 feet tall, but does not have the box elder bug, which everybody hates about box elders. So far, it's been in, in uh, New Mexico, down in UNM, he's had them for 20 years, not one box elder bug. So we started planting these about seven, eight years ago with our company, and they're really doing well. They're really a tough, tough tree. And they're over at the Eco Park, too. We planted about six of them over there. So it's a beautiful tree, nice colors, um, reddish green and red in the fall. It's really beautiful. And it is a maple. It's it the same maple, genus, yeah. hey, sir, as the yep. rest of the maples. It's, it's often called box elder maple, I think. Yeah. yeah. Next slide. Some of the other maples that we have, the more maple and the tartarian. Gordon sells a lot of the tartarian maples, and it, it does really, really well. Um, so it's not native, but again, it does well here right. because it's a natural it's drought species. Yeah. Tolerant. Um, uh, is that the hot wings? Is that the hot wings variety you have here? That one wasn't labeled hot wings, but okay. I bet it is because it's because the it. seeds are just red. Yeah. yeah. And you may see it listed in the catalog, catalog or you go to a nursery, it may say hot, hot wings maple. So. Mm -hmm. that, that have more maples? Is that from Asia too? No. Siberia? Probably. I think yeah, it's. with that name. I Siberia or probably. Um, a lot of trees come from Mon Mon Mongolia, so Manchuria. So it's a really beautiful color in the fall. Next slide, please. Fruit trees. And this is the simple form. I got more answers and more about fruit trees. And my last talk, I said, some need pollinators. Boy, what a statement is that? <laughs> so I, I can add to that today. <laughs> The self-pollinating fruit trees are apricots, nectarines, peaches, and sour cherries. That means they don't need a pollinator. The ones that need pollinators are apples, pears, plums, and sweet cherries. And they have to have a, a tree of the, a different variety of the same fruit. That's the way it's classified. So an apple needs an apple, a pear won't pollinate an apple, but a uh, different variety of the same fruit. And that's within like a hundred feet or three-tenths of a mile or something? I think it's a, more like a quarter to three-tenths of a mile. Because it's insect pollination. Yeah, the, yeah because the bees no. are the ones or the, the pollinators in the area will pollinate that tree. And I've even heard a mile, but I, I'd get lost in a mile if I was a bee. So I may take the wrong turn. So. So bees is another thing I like to mention because bees, we need to have more beehives around. And I'm glad that book, you talked about that lady earlier. Now those are all native bees. Okay. Which are often ground dwellers. Ground dwellers. Okay. So that was going to add to your um, comment about no bare ground. Uh-huh. Well, maybe when you get to mulching. A little bare ground under plants uh -huh. 
is good because that's where the bee, the native bees. They uh, like bare ground. Yep. Okay. Not a lot, but just you know, little just enough here to and there. hide into. Okay. Right. They're not going to dig under four inches of mulch. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, a few rocks to hide in the mason bees. Okay, the mason bees, rock. rocks. Or yeah. Then there's some. Or, yeah, yeah I ran into a bunch of those. Uh, I was doing a landscape job. She didn't. Her grass would never grow. This is a weird story. <laughs> Her grass wouldn't grow, so I took a shovel and I said, let's go look at your grass. Put the shovel down, she had two inches of soil, then bedrock. So I made a joke, I says, you need to get, you know, have more soil here so I can dig out the bedrock, you know, with a jackhammer. She goes, okay, do it. <laughs> so the, the side part of that story is she had this hundred yard long dry stack wall, beautiful wall. It's been there 30, 40 years. So I take the jackhammer, I have my crew there, three guys, and I start jackhammering. 5,000 bees came out of that wall. And it just looked like a cartoon. All my work, workers <laughs> ran across the field. Me, I'm here with this 80 pound jackhammer going, oh no. <laughs> but supposedly the masons don't sting. The well, we, wherever they were, they were masons then because we got, you got stung. really so bad. I couldn't even honey bees. look out of my eyes. Yeah. So the end of that story is the lady had so many landscapers there that I didn't show up for a couple of days. And she called my house, she goes, why aren't you coming? Are you giving up on my property? And my wife says, no, he, he was at the hospital, he got shot, he got stung by your bees from your wall. And he said, she goes, you're just telling me a story. So my wife put me in the truck, throw me over there, and the lady, it looked like somebody took a baseball bat to my face. But, so anyway, it was, we finished the job, but. Ray Torres helped us because we would smoke the, tr uh, smoke the wall, put plastic over it during the day, take the plastic off every night so the bees can come back to their home, and we did that for seven days. So now wow. she has beautiful sides. So. so anyway, to get back to fruit trees, <laughs> um, um, that's about self-pollinating and pollinating, but the only thing I don't have listed here is ornamental flowering trees. And we have a lot of ornamental flowering trees that really do well here in Taos. Crab apples, 12, 15 species of crab apples. Red, pink, magenta, boy, there's so many different crab apples there. White, there's beautiful crab apples and they're really a tough tree. So that's a naturalized tree. They're not all native to the area. Uh, and they're some, a lot of them are fruitless. We have flowering pet plant pears. We have flowering cherries, and we have flowering plums. So these are flowering, no fruit. Next slide. Okay, my big comment to all my classes is, when you're going out, you don't go to the nursery first and say, oh, that tree looks great, let me take it home. You do your homework first. You look up plant or tree profiles to see what will do well at your home site, because the right tree for the right place and the right time is key for survival. These are organisms. They'll be around with you for longer than we can live, some of them. I work on an orchard right now over on Cruz Alta that is 110 years old. And it's still producing apples. So it's a wonderful thing to have these in our lives. So the right time is what I'm going to talk about just a little bit because I'm running kind of late is do not plant June, July, and August when temperatures are hot and dry. I had to write a, a paragraph for the town of Taos because they wanted to plant trees on the plaza. They got behind on their schedule, so they wanted to plant them this last two weeks. <laughs> so, what I did is I wrote out an article for the town manager and the facility service director and the mayor and I told them why you shouldn't plant in the summer. And these are some of the items that I came up with. The tree food reserves are really being taxed because photosynthesis is at a very, very low. It's not making any food. Second, the roots are in a root ball. There's not many absorption roots in those trees. It takes them three to five years for these big 20-foot trees to even put out absorption roots. So that's another thing, you're gonna put them in the ground and the ground's gonna be very, very hot. The soil temperatures now are just as hot as the air temperatures. So that's another thing why you don't wanna plant in the hot sun. Evaporation is another thing. You put the water in, it goes right back out. 
The tree wants to stay cool, transpires a lot. It's losing a lot of their moisture. All of these factors are why you shouldn't plant in the heat of the summer. We do get monsoons coming in, so I tell people to wait until later in August when the soils are cooling down, the air temperatures is more reasonable, and start planting at the end of August. But please don't plant when it's extremely hot because the tree is going to suffer, you're going to suffer because you're going to be out there trying to keep the tree alive, and it's just going to, it, it's got a very slim chance of making it if it's not cared for properly. Okay? So don't plant, June is, I never plant in June. We start, we stop Memorial Day and then we start planting in August, in August, beginning in September. Okay? So, landscape care is very important. Maintenance is very important. You have to be steward of your land. So remember, if you have a piece of property and you plant something, you are now the steward of that plant. It's a living organism, so you have to care for it. And that means watering it, fertilizing if you need it. The next slide is about soil, so we'll go right to that. And I just want to mention rain harvesting. Does everybody know about catch systems, rain barrels? And the new thing is curb cuts. Most of your roads have curbs all the way down the highway. They're put, taking out those curbs and letting the natural rain water trees along their street trees. So that's something, oh, use the water while it's running down. Don't let it go into the, into the that's, rain. That's so. Tucson, it's really. Tucson's really that. big on that. Yeah. And the guy that does that book, this book is really state of the art. It's called Rainwater Harvesting. It's by Brad Lancaster. It's a very good book if you want to get into harvesting your water. Teresa has 3,500 mm -hmm. tanks. She catches water off a roof. Can you imagine how much water you could have? Uh, it depends on the size of your roof. There's a formula. If it rains and you get a half an inch of rain and you have so many square feet, you can get quite a bit of rain, uh, catch a lot of rain off your roof. So that's something we should think about in the future. And if you're putting in a tank, go larger rather than smaller. Correct. My 60 trees, I run out of my 70, 1,700 gallon tank I put in a couple of years ago uh -huh. pretty quick this time of year. Uh-huh. Because so of the heat and dry. Go larger. Yeah, right. Go larger, yeah. Or you put two of them in. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and underground, yes. If you can. If yeah. you can. Yeah, very, I agree. Okay, soil testing is really important. If you want to know what to start on your landscape, you should have a soil test. And there's a handout at the Ag building from uh, the extension agent, how to collect samples. It's really simple. You go around, you collect it in a bucket, mix it up, put it in a court bag, give it to the county agent. He actually can run a test for like $17 or $20, or it could be a little bit more. But he can run a basic soil test for you. Soil compaction, my story about that is, Martyr's Steakhouse used to have three beautiful spruce trees there. They all died from compaction when they started construction there. It took them six months to die. They were 40, 50 foot spruce trees. It was just from soil compaction. Most of your trees get oxygen from the soil. So if you start compacting the soil, you can actually kill trees. Feed soils from the top down, that's always been the case. You don't put fertilizer in the newly planted trees because you shouldn't put any fertilizer the first year. You want it to naturalize to the site. Feed the soils from the top down. Put compost and all your feeding compost on top of the ground, not in the hole. Um, my mix that I use in the springtime is Umix, which is mined here in New Mexico. It's concentrated organic matter. My analogy is a dinosaur died in one spot, and now they're digging it back up and we're using it. Uh, neem oil is a great product because it promotes good soil microorganism. Uh, agricultural molasses is natural iron. Fish and seaweed is actually what I use to feed my trees in the spring only. I don't use it in the fall. Because I don't want to promote too much growth in the fall because of that dor natural dormancy that trees actually want to go to in the fall. Okay. Next slide. Are there differences in your cocktail with the type of tree, like pines versus 
to see what you was treating? Nope. Nope? Nope. nope. I, I treat them all the same, and it's very, it's a soil food, it's not a fertilizer. They're all food, except for the fish and the, and the seaweed. And I, and I do change my concentration on fish and seaweed depending on the tree. Because you know, evergreens keep their needles for three to five years. So they're, they're actually storing more and need more energy. That's my feeling. And they're in a alkaline soil, so they need a little bit more help. And that's why I use, I actually use, use more humates on evergreens. Because humates is actually that buffer from, from that acidic pHs. Uh, watering trees, trees that shows me deep watering, I tell people to water them once a week. I did add something to that slide real quick. It's about the tree species, the size of the tree for watering, it's all different. But Gordon's comment is for every inch in diameter, the tree should get 10 gallons a week. So if you have a soil moisture meter, <laughs> and you put it in the soils, all of a sudden your soils are holding the moisture more than a week. So maybe it's once every two weeks that you give it that 10 gallons for every inch of caliber. Caliber is the diameter of a tree. So if a tree is two inches in diameter, it needs 20 gallons. Three inches needs 30 gallons. And but what about, they say, what about a 26 inch tree? <laughs> It's pretty established. You don't have to get more than 30 or 40 <laughs> gallons for a tree that size. And these are our big cottonwoods that are on dry sites. So I, I can't see putting 260 gallons on a cottonwood tree. Because <laughs> they store water and it moves through the systems. So a soil moisture meter, which you can buy at Ace, is the key of you uh, understanding how much your soils hold your moisture. You stick it in the soil, it, the ones that have ace, it's either yellow, you don't have enough, green, you're perfect, or red, you have too much. And I tell people to put it on all sides of the tree. The sun goes around the tree, so the soils dry out differently. So you start on the east side, you stick it in there, you try it on the south, west, and north. You'll find out the north is usually the one that has the most moisture in it. It stays there the longest. So it's just common sense when you water your trees at the drip line. Just so you know, there's not too many trees that have tap roots. So that bubbler or watering a tree at the trunk, you're not helping the tree at all. Mother Nature made the drip line where the center of the absorption roots are for trees. So that's what Mother Nature, it rains, the tree gets water right where it needs it. And it takes up the nutrients right where it needs it. So there's not many roots underneath the canopy of a tree. Next one. So you have to uh, water a tree for the for the for the life of the tree, or or can you tail it off that as it gets? That's a, that's a question I get often. Is because um, they say my trees are getting established, and the only example I can give is big spruce trees now are dying because people haven't watered them for 20 years. They've been in their yard. They do need some supplemental water because you planted the tree there and the tree didn't pick its spot. So it's a landscape tree. Even though if it's a native species, <laughs> you picked it and picked the spot for it. So you have to care for it when during the dry time. So you just can't let it go. Um, especially we have a spruce bark beetle that's taken out a lot of the old spruces right now as we speak. So it came down from southwest Colorado They've lost over 500,000 square acres of trees from Montrose all the way to Grand Junction. And again, it's, we don't have our fires, the trees are getting too crowded, so Mother Nature says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this, I'm going to do clean the house. So she, she has a native natural insect infestation that wipes out the trees. So, and then the strong ones survive, and then it goes on. So, um, Planting and pruning is a whole other topic, but www.treesaregood.com is a great place to find out information. You go there, you can print out how to plant, how to prune, and then they actually have a tree's owner's manual that you can download. It talks about watering, pruning, planting, site location, how to figure out where to plant trees. You know, evergreen should never be on the southwest side because they'll shade your tree in the wintertime 
and you need that sun in the wintertime, they should be on the northeast side of your house. You need your deciduous trees on the southwest west side, so the leaves drop, and in the wintertime when the sun's lower, you still get that radiant heat coming through. So you don't want to put evergreens on the south southwest or west side of your home. I think that's it. I had to speed up. But is that good? Yeah, great. Yeah, it's great. I want to. Yeah, you you have an additional handout, right? That yeah. has the detail about the the fruit trees uh -huh. and who pollinates uh -huh. who. Yeah. So, because he made a handout and I made a handout. So I have another handout. For you. Yeah. It's just an ex, ex, uh, expanded version of hers. So. So, any other questions for Paul? Yeah, questions. I yeah, need we questions. Need to do the pruning workshop. Excuse me? When are you going to do the In July. Workshop? July is the next time we prune. So I'm glad you mentioned. We prune, we prune from, I'll say, February and March for evergreens. Like we do evergreens all winter long. Not in the dead of winter, but we start in November, stop when it's freezing, and then when it starts warming up, we do evergreens. And then in March, we start doing our fruit trees. And we stop that about mid April when they start breaking buds. And then our shade trees, we stop about mid-May because of the insect population. Because if you're pruning trees, you're inviting insect to the tree because they're all scent activated. So we stop pruning, uh, pruning shade trees about mid-February until July. July is another good time to prune fruit trees and shade trees because you don't get regrowth. And at, at that workshop, we're going to start a workshop about mid-July for everybody, it'll be a free workshop announced for the town. So, I want to know what you know about the um, I think it's Charles County Soil and Conservation Office who got a grant to um, to help homeowners pay for thinning of trees. Yeah, it's called the Firewise Grant. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and I know you have to apply for it, and I know you go down to the ag centers, their office at the ag center, I guess, to pick up the application. But who does the thinning then? Well, two things. There's three ways to do it, actually. Three ways. Okay. okay. They have a crew that do it through um, the, uh, a contractor that they feel comfortable doing it through the county, county soil and water district. Okay. The second one is there's private people that they have a list that we can do the thinning for you properly. Third is you can do it yourself. I just talked to a homeowner that did it last year. You don't get as much refund money, that, that match money, uh -huh. because you, you, have to, you have to tell them what it costs and labor hours and, and stuff, and they, they refund you some of that money. So there's three people that can do it. Uh, the private people, are very good. Anybody that's on that list, I would kind of stand behind them because they're all been um, invest not investigated. They've been vetted. 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 Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, and then they have their own contractor. So. And, and they're sort of certified tree people. They're certified tree people. The only thing I don't agree with them uh -huh. is to do it in the summertime. Yeah. Anytime that. An insect is flying and you're doing pruning is not a good max for me because that's a boring insect. And they do some thinning in the forest in the summertime and I don't agree to that. So, so this one that you can apply to um, as a private homeowner and hire a private um, contractor, a contractor um, can you set up the time and say, Look, I, I want to apply for this to get in on the application, but way to do it? I think, I think the way they do it is you put in the application, the guy comes out and inspects your property. Oh, okay. okay. And he's the one that kind of sets the scheduling and lets you know who you should get and who he recommends and, and all that. It's the guy that comes out and looks at your property. And the application is uh, you're accepted to go through your bill. Okay. It's, very, it's coming up. Yeah. It's coming up for, for this fiscal year. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, good. Yeah. And, and a lot of people do it on their own, and they still get some money back. Okay. So you just have to document your hours and how much labor you put into thinning. And then they come in, out and inspect it again. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a two inspection, before and after. Because they have some requirements, how far it has to be from your home, 30 feet, how much they have to take out. There's, there's some some. Um, is that just the town or the county also? No, it's the, ca it's the county. The county. The county. Yeah. They do it everywhere in the county. So. That's actually an interesting resource. I'm thinking of Millicent Rogers Museum. Uh -huh. Really needs the service. Well, it's mainly because of fires. So it's about it's based on fires and the building and the home. I it's see. called Firewise Protection. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, I kept you guys so long. Mm -hmm. I, I can awesome. still talk too. <laughs> Did I give you enough information? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. And I, 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 and I have card, cards up here. My free service is if you email me with a question, I'll get back with you. It may take me one or two days, but I'll get back with you. And then when we start emailing back and forth, it's about your tree and the problem and the location of the tree. So maybe pictures. I, I love seeing pictures on my email.